Hello, my name is Ian Oglesby, Mayor of the beautiful city of Seaside. I and the residents of Seaside welcome new and returning students. CSUMB is a wonderful and learning institution, and I know it's important for you and them of your uh, educational goals and success. The residents of Seaside believe in education and the importance of higher education. We stand in support of your goals. We look forward to seeing you visit the city of Seaside, dining, and enjoying yourself, but more importantly, just having a good time. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Eugene Jones, pastor of the Emmanuel Church of God in Christ here in the beautiful city of Seaside. It's my pleasure to welcome you to CSUMB, the Monterey Peninsula, and to invite you to worship with us at any of the six churches of God in Christ here on the Monterey Peninsula. As you begin the new phase of life, you will find that being separated from your family and friends will bring about new challenges. The best place to find new community, new family, and new friends is at church. As you matriculate through CSUMB, you will find yourself in need of spiritual, emotional, and mental support. The church is the place where you can find all of that in a safe, loving environment. No matter where you are on the Monterey Peninsula, there is a Church of God in Christ waiting for you to join them in worship. Our locations are the Christian Memorial Tabernacle at 141 14th Street, Pacific Grove, the Emmanuel Church of God in Christ, which I warmly welcome you to at 1450 Sonoma Avenue here in Seaside, the Greater Victory Temple, which is at 1620 Broadway Avenue in Seaside, the Mount Olive Church, which is at 20 Salinas Road, Watsonville, or maybe you're in Salinas and you can find the Royal Family Church of God in Christ at 671 East Market Street in California. You may be as far as Santa Cruz and you could find the Word of Life Church of God in Christ at 231 Wilk Circle, Santa Cruz, California. You're always welcome at the Church of God in Christ. Hotep, young warrior students of African ancestry, welcome to the Village Project. My name is Regina Mason, and I'm one of the co-founders of The Village Project, Incorporated. I've lived here in Seaside all of my life. In fact, I was born on the former Fort Ord uh, in a, an Army hospital, and most of the students that I grew up with and community members are military-connected. Now that the military has left the area almost over 20 years ago, uh, we basically are living in an environment where we've been gentrified out of the community of Seaside as people of African ancestry and out-migrated. And the fact that students of African ancestry are coming to Cal State Monterey Bay, I am hoping that you will come to the Village Project. You have an open, extended invitation to come to the Village Project so that we can share our wisdom and knowledge of the historical perspective of the city of Seaside. Hotep, again, which means uh, the God in me greets the God in you. It's an ancient uh, African greeting. Uh, welcome to Cal State University Monterey Bay, a place, by the way, where I used to work, uh, so I can kind of attest to the type of uh, university that you're coming to. As Regina pointed out, our agency is called The Village Project. She and I co-founded this agency about 14 and a half years ago. Uh, we're primarily an African-American family resource center, which means that we do therapy. Uh, we also have an after-school academy. We have a number of other programs that are designed to help not only African-Americans, uh, but all other people of color, folks from the LGBTQ uh, plus community and others. Um, in welcoming you to uh, the university, we certainly are welcoming you to our community. Seaside, as Regina pointed out, has been gentrified, but it is still a historical place uh, for African Americans. We want you to come and visit us. We want you to come to visit our churches. We want you to come to visit the Village Project, where we have uh, established over the years a, a, a very strong partnership with Cal State University Monterey Bay through the Service Learning Institute and also we are a placement site and a training site uh, for interns in the uh, university's uh, Master of Social Work um, program. So again, welcome, the best of everything to you. I, I would say best of luck to you but you know really what you need to do is come here and work <laughs> and, and, and work hard 
and the luck comes from you working hard and being successful. And we wish you every success, and, and you have an open invitation to come and visit us here at the Village Project in Seaside. Ashe. Ashe. To God be the glory for the things he has done. He has done great things for us, and we all can say hallelujah and thank God. I bid you greetings in the matchless name that is above every name, that name of he who died but yet still lives, that of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To all of the staff and the entire student body of the Cal State University of Monterey Bay, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to the Monterey Peninsula community. I am the Reverend Dr. Anthony Dunham, who for the past 28 years have served as pastor of this historical community, biblically based body of believers, Friendship Baptist Church, located at 1440 Broadway Avenue, Seaside, California. The church where the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. preached during the civil rights years in the 60s, but where Jesus Christ still speaks through his word every day. Let me first say, thank God and appreciate you for your aspiration to continue your higher education here on the Monterey Peninsula by way of our local university, CSUMB. But while you are reaching forward to obtain your higher educational degree that will certainly benefit your life's journey, please do not neglect your spiritual journey. While you're away from your home church, we encourage you to let Friendship Church be your college church. My wife, myself, and the entire Friendship family would like to take this time to invite and encourage you to be with us in church for worship every Sunday morning, beginning with Sunday school at 9.30 a.m. and morning worship at 10.45 a.m. You can go to our website, friendshipseaside.com, Dot org, or you can visit us by way of Facebook at Friendship Baptist Church Seaside or on YouTube, Friendship Space, Baptist Space, Church Space, and Seaside. If you need a ride, please call ahead or reserve a seat on our church van. The church number to call is area code 831-394-2966. That's 831-394-2966. We will connect you with this community while keeping you connected to the community of believers. Thank you for allowing us this time to invite and to encourage each of you. We look forward to meeting you personally. Until then, go with God and go in peace. And may the Lord bless you real good. Welcome to CSUMB and the beautiful Monterey Peninsula. I'm Yvonne Thomas, President of the Monterey County NAACP. Starting at the university is indeed an exciting time for you. And we want to make sure that you feel at home here in our community and that you have the opportunity to join us in our mission, which is to fight for civil rights and to eliminate race-based discrimination. We invite you to attend one of our regular membership meetings which are held on the fourth Thursday of each month at 7 p.m. at the Oldemeyer Center in Seaside. Or if you decide you want to become a member, please visit our website at www.montereynaacp.org. You have chosen one of the most beautiful places in the world to matriculate. We hope that your experience is an enjoyable one and welcome to you. We look forward to meeting you soon. Hello CSUMB students. My name is Pastor William Todd Granger. I am the pastor of Holy Assembly in Marina, California. We are located at 3305 Abdi Way. We want to welcome you to the peninsula. We want to encourage you and invite you to come and worship with us. Uh, we start our worship service Sunday at 1115. Our Sunday school starts at 10. And on Wednesday night we have a Bible study from 6 o'clock to 730. You're welcome to come and join us and fellowship with us. 
May God be with you and bless you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. How y'all doing? Y'all look good. How's the food? <laughs> Welcome to the seventh annual All Black Gala. All Black Gala celebrates black history and the immense diversity of black culture, brilliance, and lived experiences. Before we get started, we wanted to invite you to take pictures at one of our photo booths. You can download the photos immediately to your phone, or you can have somebody send it to you. <laughs> um, my name is Jamie Booth. I'm a psychology major, sociology minor, and I expect to graduate in the spring of 2024. I start all my speeches by saying that because I'm be looking for a job and I might hit you up. So. Yeah, I'm the president of the Black Students United here at CSUMB, and I'm also a member of the African Heritage Research Collaborative, where we examine the experiences of black students across various CSU campuses. Uh, my career goals include becoming a mentor for black and brown students in low-income neighborhoods to inspire them to pursue higher education. I believe that education is one of the ways we as a community can dismantle oppression. Um, I eventually want to go on to become a doctor of psychology. As some of you may know, CSUMB's black student population has decreased from 8% to 3% within the past few years. Because of that, navigating college has been an interesting journey for me. I get to teach people about black culture and the way we do things in our community, but at the same time, not knowing where to fit in outside of the BSU. For that, I would like to thank my mentors for supporting me and pushing me to become the best version of myself possible. Dr. Vanessa Lopez Littleton. Professor Daniel Summerhill, Dr. Dennis Conde, Dr. Nate Yu, Dr. Rudy Medina, Deja Robinson, and Victoria Gomez. Y'all are the real goats. Without y'all, I wouldn't have had this opportunity to be up here co-hosting this tonight, um, this meeting for tonight. So thank you. And my name is Tyshawn Meeks. I'm a communication design major graduating this semester, actually. Yeah. I'm also the signature program student coordinator for the Otter Cross Cultural Center, the vice chair of the Otter Student Union Board of Directors, and a resident advisor for the student housing and residential life. Yeah. With that being said, aside from, the, aside from these, I've held many other positions on campus. So my experiences range from a student to a staff member. And with this experience, I would like to share what I learned with other students that look like me in higher ed and give them the opportunity to succeed and manipulate the odds in their favor. My time in college has been an uphill battle, but the knowledge and support that I've received from this university and its staff, faculty, and surrounding community is like no other. This year's theme is celebrating black excellence in STEM, leading the way. We are so thankful to have Dr. Calvin Mackey with us today to speak more on what this means for our community. We begin this event by acknowledging that the California State University, Monterey Bay, is established on the indigenous homeland of the Esalen people. It's important to recognize that we are on stolen land where indigenous people were unjustly removed through physical and cultural violence. As we celebrate today, we must acknowledge that we recognize that we are the beneficiaries of that removal. Yeah, yeah. We encourage everyone to remember our responsibility to those who were here before us and to the indigenous communities that live, love, and protect this land. We honor their continued legacies and through our current and future work, strive to be respectful occupiers of the Esalen homeland. Remember to respect the land. Remember that ancestors rest below the pathways and in other areas. In addition, we must also acknowledge that much of what we know of this country today, including its culture, economic growth, and development throughout time and across history, has been made possible by the labor of people of color, in particular by enslaved Africans and their ascendants. Wow. 
As we acknowledge labor, we also want to thank those who are working our event. The cooks, hospitality, the tech team, the student staff, our volunteers, and faculty, and everyone else who has helped make this event possible. Please give a round of applause as this is an event of labor and labor. from Vanya Quinones, the president of the California State University, Monterey Bay. Vanya Quinones was appointed CSUMB's fourth president in August of 2022. A neurobiologist, biopsychologist, and noted researcher, she came to CSUMB after serving as provost and executive vice president for academic affairs at Pace University. Quinones has published more than 70 peer-reviewed articles. Over the course of a 20 plus year career at the City University of New York Hunter College, she served as an assistant, associate, and full professor in the Department of Psychology before being appointed to serve as the chair of the department. She was later promoted to the role of associate provost. Please join me in welcoming Vanya Quinones. <laughs> I was just telling them it's a very hard act to follow. <laughs> These are our amazing students here at CSUMB, and we're very proud of you and each of you, and especially the faculty that support them and the staff. Thank you so much. So I'm honored here. To, I'm honored to be here tonight at the old gala, at the old Black Gala to celebrate Black history and cultural diversity in our community. Thank you to the students, faculty, and staff for inviting me to be part of these important festivities. I also want to welcome the STEAM community members and donors that are here tonight. Your support helps us to increase access to higher education to BIPOC students. It allows us to use resources to support them to ensure that they graduate on time. You are helping by being here to close the equity gap in graduation. I also, when I was coming in, I saw Ellen Rocker, so I just want to really thank her for being here. <laughs> Everybody knows who Ellen is, but I just want to briefly acknowledge that she's a long-time community activist and a long-time uh, educator. And she has done a lot for our campus through the years. I don't know if you guys know, but Ellen late husband was stationed here at Fort Ord. And when he retired, he used his military benefits to complete his bachelor and master degree. Ellen created an endowed fellowship in 1998 to help other students and veterans to do the same as her late husband. Your generosity, has honored and supported our students through the years. And so when we were creating a Black Student Center to support our students, we decided to name it after her. The Ellen Rocker. <laughs> the Ellen Rockner Center for Black Excellence has become a home for our students a place to find academic, cultural, and personal support, and to also make connections. And I am excited that our theme tonight is Black Excellence in STEM. At CSUMB, we want to support all our students. And we know how important it is to diversify the science, technology, engineering, mathematics, it is important to bring the voices to these fields. I am a scientist. And when I was starting my science career, I don't know how long ago, when I was in kindergarten 40 years ago, um, I was one of the few Hispanic taking physics females. I was one of the few Hispanics on Rockefeller University. There was only a black, a black postdoc and me. And every time they wanted diversity, they used to bring us out to show how. So I ate very well at Rockefeller. 
But it struck me that most of these places, they talk about DEI, but they forget some of the letters. They forget the E, equity. Sometimes they forget the I because they see you on the table, but your chair is broken. So my goal, and the goal of CSUMB, is to ensure that we are all in the table together, that our chairs are at the same level, and that our voices have the same meaning. I have to say that it was not easy for me. When I came from Puerto Rico to complete my doctoral degree, as I said before, I was one of the few only woman of color in research spaces. So every time somebody came to ask for something, I was a secretary, I was a cleaning lady, I was like, you can imagine it. So I have faced racism. I have faced sexism. I have faced so many isms. And I, most important, have feel how discrimination makes you not feel welcome, make you feel like you don't belong. And I also talk, and I just want the students to hear this. Through my 40-year career, I have suffered and still suffer sometimes imposter syndrome. And that's when you go to places and you think that they just let you go in because you're a minority and that you don't belong there. Even with the 70 papers and even with all you guys are talking about me, sometimes I feel that the only reason I'm here is because of the color of my skin. So I have dedicated my life to make spaces to students that look like me, students that are diverse. I have dedicated my life to make spaces so their voices are heard. And so when they sit on the table, they're in the same level as everybody else. I will continue this work here at CSUMB. As I talked before, I want to remove the barriers and the obstacles that our students face. And some of those barriers are invisible. Some of them are pretty visible. Students, you belong here. And you belong at STEM. And you belong wherever you want to belong. You deserve to be here. Your future is as bright as your dreams ahead of you. And don't allow other people define you. I know that I will see their names and many of our students' names of brilliant minds that have achieved significant things for our society. I know that our students graduate and they will receive recognitions for their accomplishments. I know that they will be like people like Percy Julian, who created the process that allowed the development of medical drugs such as corticosterone and steroids. Or Katherine Johnson, a mathematician that made an early program that allowed us to go to the moon. This is my commitment as the president of CSUMB. And I know you're here as members of the community because you have the same commitment that I have that whatever our students and our members of our community want, whether it's STEM, social science, humanity, art, business, education, health science, or human services, we will create an open doors for them. And we will support them to achieve their passions and their dreams. I think we're privileged to be in such a diverse place. And today show how diversity is the backbone of our community. Here at CSUMB, we are committed to a society where everybody is valued, respected, and embraced. Value, respected, and embraced. And I'm committed to those values and CSUMB too. We have uh, rocked the boat a little bit this year, celebrating different activities on diversity. And they include such as workshops for guest lectures from a former Black Panther, to having a cultural menu offering on other kitchen. 
And I know we need to continue celebrating the contributions of black history and black American. I can't wait to see what our honorees um, this evening, um, I, I can't wait to meet them and to take some selfies with you guys. You know how much I love selfies. <laughs> Vanity over everything. <laughs> so I want to thank you today. Some of you marched with me and, and uh, with the members of the community of Matthew Luther King. And I was thinking that day was raining and it was really, really very hard. And um, I'm sure some of you got a cold. And that's how we celebrated and started celebrations. And today, we're finishing this celebration with something so important. Martin Luther King is our history. It's our hope. But the students today is how that hope will continue living and how the future of all of us is in their hands. So I want to thank to all the students that are here today. the director of the Helen Rucker Center for Black Excellence. She holds a Doctor of Philosophy in Public Affairs with an emphasis in Health Services Management from the University of Central Florida. She holds a Master's Degree in Public Administration from Louisiana State and a Bachelor's of Science in Nursing from Northwestern State University. Dr. Vanessa Lopez Littleton is a U.S. Army veteran and a registered nurse. Please put your hands together for Dr. Vanessa Lopez Littleton. Good afternoon. It is my honor to be here today for this wonderful celebration of black excellence and to celebrate the tremendous value and impact that we have and that we bring to the CSU and B campus community. So it's my pleasure to announce that the All Black Gala will become the primary fundraising event of the Helen Rucker Center for Black Excellence. <laughs> talk about money, if you will. Um, um, but we started the Helen Rucker Center three years ago this semester during the height of the pandemic when we formed the Center for Black Excellence, I mean, excuse me, the Center for Black Student Success. And interestingly enough, in this room in April of last year is when President Dr. Eduardo Ochoa announced that the Helen Rucker Center for Black Excellence would actually come to fruition. So, um, we have two. of the strength and tenacity of Mrs. Rucker and so many others from our community has now been carefully interwoven into the fabric of CSUMB. And so now we are a part of that outer raft. So thank you. During our reception last year, when we launched the Helen Rucker Center for Black Excellence, we raised over $6,000 that night. And so we have continued to raise money to advance Black Excellence at CSUMB and we will continue that tradition here today. M what's most important is that the funds raised for the Helen Rucker Center support research, mentoring, tutoring, and cultural programming. And we do most of that in collaboration with our colleagues from across the campus and out in the community. We are constantly looking for ways to showcase and highlight the work that our black faculty our staff, our students, and our community members do in Monterey, Santa Cruz, and San Benito counties, and beyond. And most importantly, the funds that we raise support our students. And this is consistent with the wishes of our namesake, Mrs. Helen Rucker, and her dedication and support and advocacy for black students, and we want to make sure that we continue that. And so we're excited to announce today that um, thank you to President Kionis and Dr. Brian Kropenny and other members of the CSUMB cabinet for allowing the Helen Rucker Center to move from just being in name only to now having a physical space on the CSUMB campus. So that's it. And what's exciting 
exciting about this is that our students will be going into the space and designing the space for themselves. So it will be for our students and by our students, and we're committed to that as well. So stay tuned. So as I wrap up today, I want to thank you for your support of the Helen Walker Center for Black Excellence. If you made the donation when you registered, let me be the first or maybe second or third to say thank you. If you have not had a chance to make your donation tonight, if you take a look on your table, there's a variety of ways to give. There are envelopes on your table. There is a QR code that's somewhere where you can click on that if you're all high tech. But our goal and our hope is that we raise more money tonight than we did last year. And so each year we're gonna be asking for money to do more because our students deserve it. And so please consider knowing that your support creates access and opportunities that will support our students at CSUMB, making their futures better and brighter. So thank you. Go Otters. We will now hear a rendition of the Black National Anthem from Nina Fawina Eze, the Vice President of the Black Students United. Lift every voice and sing Till earth in heaven ring Ring with the harmonies of liberty Let our rejoicing rise to advance K-12 STEM education across the U.S. and the world. A lifelong resident of New Orleans, Dr. Mackey graduated from high school with low test scores, requiring him to take special remedial classes at Morehouse College. But in 1990, he graduated magna cum laude from Morehouse College with a Bachelor in Science degree as a member of the prestigious Phi Bay Kappa National Honor Society. Simultaneously, he was awarded a Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from Georgia Tech, where he subsequently earned his Master's and PhD in Mechanical Engineering in 1996. While pursuing a doctorate degree, Dr. Mackey served as an instructor of mathematics at Morehouse College. Following graduation, he joined the faculty at Tulane University, where he pursued research related to heat transfer, fluid dynamics, energy efficiency, and renewable energy. In 2002, he was promoted to a associate professor with tenure. 
Mackey's 11-year academic career ended in June 2007 when Tulane University disbanded the engineering school. During the 2004-2005 academic school year, Mackey served as a visiting professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering at the University of Michigan. He enjoyed a respected academic career before pivoting his career towards entrepreneurship, consulting, and professional speaking. Mackey is also the president and CEO of Channel Zero Group an educational and professional development consulting company he co-founded in 1992. He has presented to numerous civic and educational institutions, government entities, professional associations, and businesses of every size and industrial focus. Dr. Mackey is the author of two award-winning books, <laughs> A View from the Roof, Lessons for Life, and Business in Grandma's Hands, Cherished Moments of Faith and Wisdom. He has won numerous awards, including the 2019 Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, or its Chair Phoenix Award, which recognizes the individual whose extraordinary achievements strengthen communities and improve the lives of individuals and families nationally and globally. In 2003, he was awarded the Presidential Award for Excellence in STEM Mentoring in a White House ceremony. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Calvin Mackey to the stage. First, I'd like to give thanks to God for giving me the mental, physical, and spiritual strength to stand before you. Second, I'd like to say thank you to President Keonis, the entire administration, one, for having me, but two, for having the wisdom to honor someone like Helen Rucker and have a program like this for the community to come together to celebrate their past, understand where they are in the present, and know what we need to do to go to the future. Thank you. That's the issue. Thank you to my host committee, Rudy Medina, uh, Victoria Gomez, and my friend uh, Vanessa Lopez Littleton. Thank you all for working with me and working with my office. Now I'm from New Orleans, so this is like the end of Mardi Gras. I had Mardi Gras this week. <laughs> Mardi Gras like two weeks. <laughs> so it's very difficult to like Mardi Gras and coordinate things. So thank you all for working with us. And uh, it's an honor to be here. To the MCs, to the young man and young woman, give them a hand. Congratulations to you. My name is Congratulations. We used to do that in the community. We used to give our children leadership position in church institutions like the churches and different things like that. And now children can never take the platform because a lot of times there's other people who otherwise we go won't allow the children to take the platform. They used to have institutions in the community where our children can make mistakes in the community such that that ain't my speech all on that. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, my name is Calvin Mackey, and I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm from Bacatown, Girtstown, Zion City. I'm from the Lower Nine, where we don't mind dying. I'm from that Wild Magnolia, y'all thought I told you. I'm from that CP3, you know you know me. Now what I'm trying to say is that I started from the bottom. And before this speech is over, young people, you can realize, you can realize that I can go from zero to a hundred. Real quick. Because I never needed a rapper, or entertainer, to a celebrity to tell me that I got greatness in my DNA. I come from a people, a place, a history, a time that told me with every waking blink of the eye that I had greatness in me. When I woke up, my mama, my daddy, my community, my church, the lady down the street, the barber shop, round the corner, in the park, the coach, the man, the dude on the corner told me that I had greatness in my DNA. And when we go back to that, when we realize that the imposter syndrome that many of us suffer, we won't suffer it anymore because we're going to be validated everywhere we go. But we now live in a world where everywhere we go there's some type of microaggression. Something right there to let us wonder, do I really belong here? Should I be here? Is this a place for me? Was it created for me? Should I be here? But no, tonight we come to dispel that. That's not the life we wanted for you. That's not the life your, creator, your ancestors created for you. Your ancestors died so that we can live and fight on so that the children we know that we must live. We must know this thing is about history. It's not black, it's just about black. American. We are about as American as anybody can be. This thing is real. You know, the present. 
The present is the last name of the past and the first name of the future. You can't understand where you are if you don't know where you've been. And you can't understand where you're going if you don't know where you are. This thing called history is real. As a matter of fact, John Henry Clark said, things that happened 500 years ago, things that happened 50 years ago, things that happened five years ago and five minutes ago, will inform the things that will happen five minutes from now, five years from now, 50 years from now, 500 years from now. We cannot understand where we are and what we need to be doing if we don't know where we've been. And young people, I'll never forget when I found out where I had been. Like I said, I'm from New Orleans. When I go back to New Orleans in 1996, my mentor, Dr. Morris F.X. Jeff Jr. told me in 1999, he said, Calvin, let's go. We got to go home. I said, Dr. Jeff, what you talking about? I'm a seven war hardhead, man, from back of time. He said, no, Calvin, we got to go home. Your home is Ghana, West Africa, the Gold Coast of Africa. And he put me on a plane. He put me on a plane and he flew to the Gold Coast of Africa, present day Ghana, West Africa. And I got off the plane. When I got off the plane, I put my feet on the soil, and it was like I was having a spiritual renewal. He said, Kelvin, this is where the Portuguese and the Dutch came to trade the living black gold, with, I mean the dead black gold with the living black Africans. Mm. Mm. He said, but eventually they stopped trading the dead yellow gold and they began to trade the living black Africans. Mm. And he took me over to the Elamina Castle. Mm. The Elamina Castle is still the largest uh, structure built in Sub-Saharan Africa where the Portuguese and the Dutch used to uh, capture Africans and trade them from this caps mm. castle. I had the opportunity to go and stand in a room where over 400 years ago they used to house the Africans and to this day you can still smell the stench of rotting bodies. I used to go and look through the door, they had a door of no return. And I asked, I said, why is this door so narrow? And they said, Calvin, the door is narrow because they used to starve the Africans before they put them on the ships so that they wouldn't have the strength to fight back. I was overcome by the spirit and I ran outside the castle and I stood on the coast of Accra overlooking the turbulent waters where they estimate nearly 50 to 75 million Africans had to perish such that people like myself could be here in America, in the South Americas, doing the things that we're doing. Still to this day, if you follow the shark patterns in the Atlantic Ocean, still to this day, the sharks follow the same patterns that the ships took over 400 years ago to, to the number of bodies that was disposed off the ship. And I stood on the coast of Accra overlooking the turbulent waters, and I began to think about an adage that would talk to me in middle school in New Orleans. My teacher said, Calvin, every morning in Africa, a lion awakens and realizes that he must outrun the slowest gazelle, or he shall starve. She said, Calvin, every morning in Africa, a gazelle awakens and realizes he must outrun the fastest lion, or he shall be eaten. She said, Calvin, the moral of the story is whether you wake up in Africa, Europe, California, New Orleans, New York, Calvin, when you wake up, you better wake up running. Yeah. CSU Monterey Bay, we got to remember where we come from and realize that every day we got to get up and run it. Because right now you got to realize, regardless of what's happening in America, you got to realize right now there's a little kid in India and a little kid in China studying under the cloak of darkness, preparing for the day to kick our children behind and it's not even personal. They don't care if they're black. They don't care if they're white, Asian, Hispanic, Latino. They don't care if they're LBQ, GT. The only thing they want to do is take advantage of the opportunities that our children now take advantage of. Your competition now is not New York. Your competition is not Louisiana. Your competition is not America. Your competition now is India, China, and this thing called technology. So you better wake up running. And that's where we come from. John Henry Clark said, we got to stop focusing on where the ships landed. we got to focus on where the ship took us from. And the ship didn't take any West Indies, no Jamaicans, no Barbadians, didn't take any Californians, didn't take Louisiana. The ship took Africans out of Sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah. Malcolm X said, if a cat had a kid in an oven, is it a muffin? People say, I'm not African-American. I say, that's funny because I taught school for years and I taught Mexicans who've never been to Mexico. I taught Vietnamese, they've never been to Vietnam. I've taught Russians who've never been to Russia. I've taught Indians who've never been to India. But somehow an African got off a ship somewhere and had a baby and it became something else. That's the history that we gotta get right. And when we get that history right, then we know where we come from. And when we know where we come from, we can better deal with the present. 
And I, no, I'm sorry, I didn't give up my caveat out. You know, my beautiful wife Tracy believed that I'm ADD and I've never been treated before. <laughs> so when they read that beautiful introduction, then I'm going to pay them for it. I know some of y'all was expecting a different speech for a heart. Hello, my name is Dr. Calvin Mack. Hello, I'm not going to get that. I'm sorry. Caveat number two, don't confuse my passion with anger. People like me get up and begin to explain to you the world as I see it through my lens. Do this, somebody got a problem. No, I'll never forget about speaking at General Electric. And I was at General Electric, and it was Jeff M. L. L. Sharpton and me. Now that's gangster. <laughs> and there I am with Jeff F. M. one of the most powerful CEOs in the world. And I turned to Mr. M. I said, Mr. M. L. Tickle me. He said, What? I said, Pinch me. He said, Dr. Mackey, what are you talking about? I said, Man, dreams do come true. <laughs> Who there talk to them black boys from Baxter, Girtown, Zion City, New Orleans, if you had a major corporation speaking to 1,500 of your top executives? That's the American dream. And I know when I finish that speech, there's somebody in the back of that room going, that's an angry young black man right there. And I said, no, I'm not angry. I'm just passionate. And I'm just happy tonight to be here with other passionate people. Because only passionate people can bring together a program like this and honor people like this. It takes passion to get up every day and fight through the things that we have to fight through just to celebrate and honor our history. Martin Luther King said, at the end of the day, not the words of my enemies, but the silence of my friends I shall remember. So my point is that if I'm not angry, if you're not angry, I wonder why more people ain't angry. We got the condition of our children, we got the condition of our community, we got the condition of this country. But like somebody should be mad, but like somebody should be angry, but like somebody should be taking the The president here on this, I'm not angry, I'm just passionate. And James Bond said a passion is unfriendly. He said a passion is contemptuous of all which is not itself. He said a passion contains a challenge and it contains an unspeakable hope. And everywhere I go and talk to people about education, everywhere I go and talk to people about STEM and history, I challenge them. I challenge them to see the world as it is and prepare what we need for our children in the future, but I refuse to leave them with an unspeakable hope. And this thing called hope is real. Hope is the only thing that took us from where we were. Hope is the only thing that got us where we are today. And hope is the only thing that's going to take us to where we need to go. Hope! This thing called, I got a friend named Dr. Truth. And Dr. Truth said, Brother Mack, when you lose uh, money, you've lost a little. He said, when you lose a friend, you've lost a lot. He said, when you lose hope, you've lost it. Oh. As I go around this country, looking at me in the eyes of our young people, look like they've lost it. Oh. And that's why we got to have these type of broken programs and introduce them to their ancestors and their history so they can know that the hope that's already in them, they can get up there every day and face the battles that they need to face. This thing called hope is real. I know a man ran for president and used the word hope. Now everybody want to act like hope a full letter word. Hope never did you nothing. Hope saved you. As a matter of fact, it was hope that caused the old lady to sit down and caused the nation to stand up. Oh, yes. It was hope that made George and the man uh, to see the air and believe that they could fly airplanes when their own, their own government told them they couldn't. It was hope that made George Washington call to do with a peanut a hundred years ago that half PhDs still cannot do today. It was hope that made crackheads in the teachers and pimps in the preachers. It was hope that took a 26-year-old black preacher out of them and made him believe that he could have a dream and change the world. We got to remember that Martin Luther King wasn't killed because he had a dream. Martin Luther King was assassinated because he got up every day and tried to make his dream come true. Hope was the thing that took a 47-year-old man in South Africa and sent him to jail for 27 years and he came out a world leader. Hope is the thing that took Jay-Z from big pimping to a billionaire. Hope is the thing that took Nate Jameson to space. Hope is the thing that took Robert Smith with his engineering degree to Wall Street now he's the richest black man in America. Hope is the thing that took a black boy with a white mom and a goat herding daddy and made him believe that he can be president. And a whole lot of people said, a whole lot of people said, no you can't, but America stood up and said, yes, you can. 
You see when that's a hope that little voice in your head that whispers maybe when the whole world is screaming no. And I don't know about you, Deja. I don't know about you, Johnny. I don't know about you, Rudy. When I was growing up in New Orleans, I thought my name was no. Everywhere I would go, can I go to your school? No. Can I go over there? No. You think I could be a doctor? Oh, hell no. You think I'd go to your college? No. You think I could do this? No. I remember the pretty young lady. I used to ask him all the time, can I have your phone number? No, they used to tell me? No. <laughs> But see, back in the day, they didn't want me, but now since I'm hot, <laughs> See, hope is that little voice in your head that was maybe when the whole world is screaming no. And CSU, Monterey Bay, we're here today because we don't know who's telling you no. It may be people at your house telling you no. It may be the community where you come from telling you no. It may be the person dating you that's telling you no. It may be the department that you're working in telling you no. It may be working on your PhD and people telling you no. But we're here tonight because we're telling you yes. There's not a thing in the world that you can accomplish if you put your mind to it. And that is the hope of our ancestors. That's where we are today. I still believe we live in the greatest country in the world where you can get up and, and get up every day and create a better tomorrow for yourself. But yet still, I don't understand why so many people get up every morning defeated. Hope. I was a professor at Tulane University, the first and only African American ever tenured in the history of the College of Engineering at Tulane University. That just means they denied a whole lot of qualified people before me. Right. <laughs> I used to go to work every day listening to Tupac, Me Against the World, and leave every day listening to Biggie, Who Shot Ya? <laughs> it was a battle. It was a battle every day. And I'll never forget the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. The president of Tulane University made an unbelievable decision. This is history. The president of Tulane University in the, great, in the aftermath of the greatest engineering disaster in the history of the country, the second greatest engineering disaster in the history of the world behind Chernobyl, the president of Tulane University decided to keep the football team and eliminate the engineering program. Mm -hmm. So I lost a six-figure tenure position overnight. And my buddy, who's the football coach, my buddy, who's a great Washington, who used to be the uh, dean at UCI, he called me up. He said, Mac, I can't believe you lost tenure. He said, the only way you lose tenure is by an act of God. I said, but God decided to act. <laughs> my buddy, who's the football coach, called. He said, Doc, who the hell thought I'd still be a coach in football when you'd be gone as a tenure faculty member? And I said, man, don't get it wrong. I said, maybe the brothers in the hood got it right. He said, what you mean? I said, maybe when I was studying calculus, I, I should have been studying wind sprints. Because the message that the president of Tulane University sent to our community was that you can come to this university and run that rock, dunk that ball, hit that pill, stop, drop it like it's hot and entertain us. But don't you think about coming to this university and getting a science, technology, engineering, and mathematics degree and saving yourself and your community from the next natural disaster. And that's the message many universities send to our communities every day. There's a place on this campus for you to entertain. There's not a place on this campus for you to pursue your dreams and build yourself so that you can save your community. Right. I never forget, I left the campus and I went home. My family had lost 29 houses in the aftermath of Katrina. And I got to my house and a dude was up in a tree, cutting a tree down. I said, look here, bro, you might want to get down on that tree. I went to my front door and I went to my front door and my two sons was playing with their train. Thomas train. And they got up, they ran to me and I kissed them. Mm, love you, son. And the train kept running around in the floor. I went in the kitchen. My beautiful wife Tracy was cooking for everybody. We had eight people that moved into our house. And she had she had catfish on and she had etouffee on and she was frying, you know, she, you know, she's making a world famous potato salad. And I've been eating up here. Y'all don't know how to make potato salad. But see, her potato salad, her potato salad is so smooth. I just put, I used to put it on my face. Mmm, it's a good potato salad. <laughs> and she had the fire on, and she had the vent on, and had the window open, and I just saw money going out the window. <laughs> my little nephew had moved in with me here in the corner. Here in the corner with the computer on, the TV on, the radio on, the headphones on, the iPad on. I said, man, can you just turn something off? I went upstairs, my dad, my, 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 
big brother upstairs, four years my senior, he done lost his house and his job. He upstairs, he got the TV on, the air conditioning on, the computer on. I'm like, can everybody just come downstairs and get in one room? <laughs> my daddy had moved in with me. My daddy dropped out of school in eighth grade to pick cotton in West Louisiana Parish. West Louisiana Parish at one time was the uh, greatest per capita income, richest county parish in a in the in state of the United States because of so much cotton coming out of the plantations there. And my daddy grew up sharecropping and he dropped out in the eighth grade. But then after that, Hurricane Betsy, my daddy put a ladder on his car. And for 40 years, he did roofing and employing people in the community. And he started his own roofing company. But two weeks before Hurricane Katrina, he was diagnosed with level two lung cancer. All of us evacuated, went our separate ways. Came back, took us six weeks to find out dad because telephone systems was down. This is technology. By the time I found my dad, we picked him and we tried to bring him to get him treated, to get his medicine. They couldn't treat him because the water destroyed all of his records. Took us two more weeks before we could find a place to treat him. By the time we found a place to treat him, the cancer had spread to all over his body. This big old strong man who dropped out of school in the eighth grade to pick cotton, who raised and sent six children to college. And after that Hurricane Katrina, he lost his business, he lost his dream house, and eventually he lost his. I thank God, young people, I had done something with my life such that when this imperfect man needed me, I was able to be there for I thank God I had done something with my life. Maybe y'all know imperfect men. I thank God I had done something in my life so that when this imperfect man needed me, I was able to be there for him. There he is in hospice, living with me, he in the corner, his machine's plugged up, he waving at me. Oh, I'm standing in the middle of the house. I say, God, I'm lost my job and all these people depending upon me. I thought about the two things my mom and daddy told me. My mom told me that God, that a job may be your resource, but God is your source. Spirituality is our history. It's what our ancestors used to make it through it and passed on us, and many of us are giving it up. I wrote a book called Grandma Hands because I took all of these old sayings and wisdom from, from, from older women primarily, and I put in a book. We didn't confuse this thing, education and wisdom. Many of us educated and unwise, where our ancestors was wise but not educated. They were wise and uneducated and lived to be 100. We unwise and educated and dying at 20. My grandmother used to say things like every closed eye ain't sleep. Every goodbye ain't gone. Everything done in the dark will come to light. Misery loves coming. Birds of a feather, if you lay down with dogs, get on the sleeves. Uh, na 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 na. <laughs> God only started with a mission and a vision for your family and your community. Since my daddy told me that a man's supposed to get up every day and hunt and kill, or he shall not eat, I went in my room, fell on my knees and prayed, and when I got up, since I had four STEM degrees, I was able to go out and create an alternative energy company where we take waste streams and turn it to biofuel and sell it to the bloodstream such that I was able to take care of my family, such that we never had to depend on another man, another woman, another government to do for us what we otherwise could do for ourselves. That's the American dream. And that's why it's so important for us to make sure that all of our children in our community is exposed to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, because it is the liberating force of the 21st century. You gotta have, there's three things you gotta have, skills, you gotta have skill set. You gotta have skills to pay the bills. The man and woman who doesn't have skills, ask people how much they pay. The man and woman who does have skills, uh, tell people how much they charge. We gotta make sure that you all have skills to tell people how much you charge. The fact that I had four STEM degrees, I was able to go out and create a company so I could take care of me and mine. And I'll never forget when I was trying to raise money in Silicon Valley, they met a millionaire every day in Silicon Valley. And then when I went to one VC and he wouldn't give me the money. And I'm like, man, I done built the thing. And they're like, well, we don't really know. You don't know I'm doing it. How you don't know and I'm doing it? And I thought about the picture. That in Silicon Valley every day, 
Some little white girl, little white boy, get on a bike. Get on a horse, a buggy, whatever. Get on a plane and land in San Francisco and somehow find their way to Silicon Valley. And they knock on doors and knock on doors until they get to a door that opens. And they walk in that door. And when they walk in that door, there's a man and a woman sitting behind that desk. When that man and woman right behind that desk look out, they either see their little daughter or they see their little son. And these people don't have degrees. They don't have certifications. They haven't even built it yet. They just have an idea. And somehow they walk out of there with a million dollars to pursue their journey. And we have built a whole facility and people questioning, can we do it? See, if you don't have hope and belief, if you don't understand the shoulders that you stand on, this world will make you question yourself every day, even when you buy yourself. So when I lost my job at Tulane University, I looked out into my community and I realized this big university wasn't doing what it was supposed to be doing for the community in which I grew up in. I left a university to create a community. So my wife and I put up $100,000 of our own dollars and we went out and created a nonprofit called STEM Nova to expose and inspire and engage young people in science, technology, engineering, mathematics. My son came home one day and he said, Daddy, I don't like science anymore. I said, boy, you crazy. It's in your DNA. <laughs> I said, when your mama was playing that crazy classical music, I was whispering Newton's laws to her stomach. I said, he's in your DNA. He said, Daddy, I don't like the way the teacher teaching it to teach anymore. Teacher just talked to the board. I said, son, we got to solve that. So this was privileges. I went online, I Googled, and then I got to Amazon and started buying STEM kitchen. We went in the garage and started, started, doing, started doing STEM every Saturday. My other son came to grocery store doing STEM. My neighbor's son came to grocery store doing STEM. Before you know, we had 20 kids every Saturday in the garage doing STEM. Now that was a problem because that's where my libations at. And <laughs> I couldn't have all those kids in the garage with my libations. So I said, we got to get these kids out of this garage. But one day my son came home. I said, son, what's your grade? He said, daddy, I got always. That's it. That's my boy. That's what I expect out of him. He said, my, he said, Daddy, my friends want to know how I know all this. I said, son, do you tell them you do this in the garage with your dad? He said, yeah, Dad, but my friends need this. Right. right then and there, my son realized he was exposed to people and things that his friends were not. Hmm. And in his heart of hearts, with the entropy he must have got from his mom, <laughs> <laughs> he wanted his friends to have it too. And right then and there, I realized I was keeping my time, my talent, and my treasure to my two when God had gifted me to bring something to the greater community. We took what we were doing in the garage, we took $100,000 of our own dollars because people would not believe. National Science Foundation would not believe. Universities would not believe. People who were philanthropic people would not believe. I said, but this is what our community needs. We put it in the community, and the first time we had a STEM event, a STEM Saturday, we had over 500 people on a cold, rainy, wet Saturday in New Orleans, which was absolutely amazing. Since December 14, 2013, we've engaged over 120,000 young people. We got over 200 kids fighting on Saturday mornings to come to gyms to do science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The world is coming to New Orleans trying to figure out how you all are doing this. And then people come, like big university researchers, and say, are the kids learning? I said, let me, let me see something. I said, if a kid get up on Saturday morning and report to the gym at 9 o'clock, and then that, that kid builds something with a college student and a STEM professional, after three and a half hours, they build something and it works. If you're wondering if the kid's learning, it's not the kid that needs to be evaluated. It's you. And my problem is this. This is what middle class people do for their children all the time. They give them the sense of wonderment. They give them the sense of, of failure. They get to try stuff, whether they like it or not. But as soon as we give black and brown kids something, people want to know, is it worth it? Do they value it? They take, we live in a nation that right now that allow black and brown, we live in a nation right now that makes sure every black and brown boy touches a football or basketball before the age of four. And when they go to school, we live in a nation that makes sure they get access to football and basketball. And when they get out of school, you know what they have access to? Football and basketball, and nobody questioned it. And that's why the NCAA, the NBA, and the NFL have never had a workforce problem. But yet, when we try to take a STEM and put it in the hands of every black and brown kid, everybody want to know is it worth it? Is the money worth investing? Have you piloted? What well, do you think? Do you think they can be engineers? Why should I question me? 
I started college in remedial reading and developmental mathematics. They said, C spot run, I didn't even know it, what it was. More, I said, you're right. They said, boy, go directly to remedial reading, don't pass go. Can you imagine at the age of 18 years old, when my friends from California were going to World Lit English Cop, they had to go down in the basement of the building where they called me and my buddy LD for Louisiana Dummies? And Morris took me and, and put me in front of a little machine, and every day we let the words go by faster and faster and faster. And Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays, President Emeritus, had a quote on the wall that said, when you find out you're behind in a race of life, we got two choices, run faster or quit. And the problem in America is that many of us are getting up behind, and we're refusing to run faster. Young people, you got to get up, and you got to run, and you got to run, and you got to run. I ran and I ran and I ran. My friends laughed and they laughed and they laughed. But after three and a half years after starting Morehouse in remedial reading and developmental mathematics, I finished Morehouse number one in mathematics, number five in the largest class in Morehouse ever graduated, magnitude large in five days of happiness. And when they put a microphone in front of my face and said, when your mother went to a state approved Negro high school and your father dropped out of school in eighth grade to pick cotton, who the ever thought you would come to Morehouse and do the things you have done? They said, what are you going to do now? I said, man, you know what? They said, what? I said, man, you know what? They said, what? I said, I'm going to go to Georgia Tech. It's only a mile and a half away and a $1.50 bus ride. <laughs> Students, when I came out of high school, documented Georgia Tech wouldn't even give me an application. Wow. But after three and a half years where I was in an institution, where I was wrong a president, where I was wrong faculty members, who spoke to my somebodyness, who gave me hope and put me in situations like this and let me know no matter what the world was saying about me and did to me, and right here, you can go from here all the way around the world. I left Georgia Tech, and two weeks later, I started Georgia Tech, and eight years later, I had three uh, engineering degrees with a PhD in mathematics. I mean, in mechanical engineering. I don't tell that story, man. I tell that story to let you know that God has impregnated each and every one of us with something so great, such so that when you give birth to it, it'll make Bill Gates look like a midget. And I end up with history. And yet, still, too many of us have already committed to having abortions on our dreams. What is it you think you've been put on this earth to do? Because you're living in a country where you can accomplish. Young people, if you want to know how you got to where you are today, look at the five people you hung out with five years ago. If you want to know where you're going to be five years, you know, look at the five people you're hanging out with right now. Because the greatest strategy in life is sometimes meeting a man or woman you should have been. And a lot of people yoke themselves to people going nowhere. And 10 years later, y'all still the best of friends nowhere. Because somebody didn't say, this is not my lot in life. This is not where my ancestors put me here. This is not why my daddy died. This is not why my mama fought for me just to be mediocre and average. And still to this day with my reading disability, I get up and I'll be on a plane with one finger and I'm reading because the secrets to the universe, the universe and the books that we're no longer reading. Because I understand that first thing we got to get is skill sets, and after we get those skill sets to pay the bills, next thing we got to get is assets. And assets is not what you put on you. Assets is not something you sit on. Assets are the people that you surround yourself with. And that's why this thing is important. And that's why when the young lady said, with no mix, I may be calling you, what she was saying is that now you're a part of my asset base. And if they call, they don't respond, you holler at me. And after you get your skill sets, you get your assets, the most important thing that we miss up, that we mess up, that we forget that we need, that's mindset. You can have all the skill sets and assets, you won't have the wrong mindset and it's done. Celebrities and entertainers teach us that every day. But our ancestors taught us that if we have the right mindset, we can get the skill sets and the assets. You get your mind right, you're going to be all right. And you get your mind right by studying. Even in the scriptures, say study to show yourself approved. But we watch the football games, the basketball games, and when the Lakers lose or the Saints lose, we get mad and say, they must have didn't practice. But we want to be professionals, and then we don't practice. We don't study. We don't read. Then we show up and be mediocre and mad when I fire you. But I still know the right now. Started in my garage with 100000 of our home dollars. We engaged over 125,000 kids in STEM. We got over 32 employees. We're doing $5 million a year in revenue. We're building a 15 a million dollar, 30,000 square foot STEM city, STEM center in the inner city of New Orleans. Because my brother is a young man by the name of Anthony Mackey. You may not 
No, but Anthony Mackie is Captain America. He was Papa Doc and Eight Mile. He just, leave, he just left to go to Germany, start filming Captain America 4. I'll never forget, I was trying to get him into STEM. Our mother had passed away. And when my brother said I wanted to be an actor, I said, you're not going to stand on the corner and be discovered. You're going to go get your skills. So they had a place for him to go, the New Orleans Center of Creative Arts. So if there's a kid in New Orleans like John Baptiste who wanted to be great, like Wynn myself, like Anthony Mackie who wanted to be great in the arts, there's a place for him or her to go. If there's a football player, a basketball player in the city of New Orleans, there's a place for them to go. But when my son in, in middle school said he wanted to learn artificial intelligence, there was no place for him to go. So now we're going to build a place where my son and other kids can find a drive so they can learn the skills of the 21st century. So they can create a, a Bayou Silicon Valley and get investors and create the next companies of the 21st century such that their children, children would know that they lived and created wealth for them. In closing, I want you all to know this thing called STEM is for everybody. I tell my brother all the time, you're an actor, but use your platform to promote that which is transformative for everybody. My goal now is to make everybody STEM literate. COVID showed us that STEM literacy is very poor in America. We need to create STEM literacy such that no matter what you go into, you won't be intimidated or dominated by technology. So it doesn't matter what your major is. The major, what you've got to do is make sure that you have everything you need so that you can operate in the 21st century. And in closing, I want y'all to know, I'm coming back to Monterey Bay. I'm gonna come back in a little bit warm. When the sun is out. I got here late last night and I gotta leave early in the morning. And I used to travel a lot, President Keonis. I used to travel a lot, speaking all over, and I never forget my two sons, one is in college now at Howard, and the other one trying to go to, thinking about where you want to go to college. My wife came to me, she said, look, you got to stop all this traveling. And I said, look, you know, this is, I got to do this. She said, look, I'm trying to raise these boys, I need you here. I said, oh, that's good, but look, I got to travel. She said, why you got to travel? I said, don't you like to eat? Because if my mouth ain't moving, we ain't eating. She said, I get it, I got it. I, she said, but you know, I need you here with the boys. I said, yep, I need to be here with the boys. She said, but you know, I want you here too. I said, look at you all in love. <laughs> she said, look, I need you here for these boys. I said, look, if the plane go down, I want my sons to know two things. She said, don't talk like this. The only thing I want my sons to know, one, that I was a man, and two, I got up every day and tried to answer those existential questions of one, why am I here? I mean, who am I and why am I here? She said, look, y'all don't talk like that. She said, look, if the plane go down, woman, there's only one word I want on a tombstone. She said, don't talk like that. We need you here. Don't talk that to us. I said, look, because after the time when they was hijacked the airplane, the plane disappeared in Malaysia, they ran the plane into the mountain. She's like, look, I said, tell them this. If a plane go down, I'm on it. If CNN show up, you tell them. Yeah, he was in there fighting, because that's who I am. <laughs> don't tell them I didn't know I was up there fighting. She said, stop acting crazy. Come and say, look, woman, if the plane go down, you're going to be all right. She said, stop talking like this. She said, look, if the plane go down, you're going to be all right. She said, well, how all right am I going to be? <laughs> I said, double indemnity, all right. <laughs> she said, fool, stop talking. I said, look, woman, listen to me for one time. I said, if the plane go down, there's only one word I'm on on my tombstone. And she said, all right, fool, what's the word? I said, empty, because I want the world to know. I gave it my all. C-S-U-M-B. Give it your all our ancestors deserve. Thank you. Worldwide instead of just New Orleans? See, so why you gotta go there? 
I had lunch with you. I knew you was gonna have some. Actually, last Monday, the Boeing Corporation presented us with a mil one million dollar check. Um, and there are discussions with certain factions in California to replicate what we're doing in in California. Pilot one in uh, SoCal, another pilot in like northern Northern California. I'm not at liberty to say uh, with whom, but the goal is we, we built a model that's scalable, transferable, and reproducible. It is a career to career pipeline that every kid deserves. And this is not about me, it's about making sure that every community has access to things that my son got in that garage. And that's what we built. So our goal is to find what I call edge evangelists around this country, put it in their hands, train them up. And the process is two all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions. On the sesame seed bun. And if they follow this prescription, they're gonna get what we've got. So the answer is yes. Dr. Mackey, I just wanted to know if you know that your girl here, Rucker. Yes, ma'am. She's from this place, uh, kind of called the Red Stick, Louisiana. Uh, I got you. We got Baton, stick. Baton Rouge. I told we got some bad rules. Uh, a southern, southern graduate. Okay. Honor. And master's from Louisiana State University. Yep. It's an honor to know you. Let's try to get a picture. Uh, we, uh, we started STEM Baton Rouge, meeting with the new chancellor at Southern soon, because we have STEM Grambling. STEM Grambling is backed by Magic Johnson and Sodexo Magic. So, the new chancellor of Southern, like, why do we not have STEM Southern? I say, hey man, you're the president. <laughs> so, <laughs> so probably STEM Baton Rouge would be called STEM Southern soon, STEM Southern at Baton Rouge or something like that. My home girl is an honor. <laughs> That's a whole other thing I'm gonna talk about, the migration pattern, right? Uh, it was technology that really infused the migration pattern for African Americans in 1944. Uh, in Clarksdale, Mississippi, something was rolled out called the automatic cotton picker. The automatic cotton picker was able to pick the cotton of 100 men. And that's expedited the great migration of black people from the south to all different areas. And if you was in New York, if you was in Louisiana, Arkansas, Texas, more than likely you went west. That's why there's so many expatriates of Louisiana out in California, Portland, and uh, Washington. Because once they hit LA looking for jobs, then they went up there. Western Seaboard and mining and shipping in, in the Northwest. So, when this thing, we start talking about technology, I do a whole presentation called The Disenfranchisement of the African American Through the Advent of Technology. There's a saying that said the automatic cotton picker did more to free the African American from a slave economy than the Emancipation Proclamation ever did. talk. It's um, really in enlightening to hear about your journey. Um, I have a question about inspiring students in the current political environment. Um, I was at the University of Virginia for some work and I arrived on the day that several students were killed um, as a result of gun violence and I was speaking to students and realizing that they, you know, had been going through drills their entire career in school, you know, for active shooters. And um, it feels like one of many new ways in which young students are under attack. And I guess I wonder um, what you would tell students who, for one reason or another, feel scared to uh, pursue an education. I mean, that's my life's work. Uh, that's, that's what I said, you know, we live in the greatest country in the world, but yet and still people get up every day and feel uh, disempowered when you have the world right before your hands. So the question is, the challenge in this speech, so how do I talk about STEM, but also talk about inspiring people to get off their behinds and do something. So as an educator, it's not enough for us to capture their mind. I told somebody earlier that higher education has become like hospital with doctors that don't want sick patients. And they go out, these doctors, and find the best, well, patients they can find. And then bring them on camp, campus and hold them for four years. Then after four years, they brag about the fact that their well patient didn't get sick. 
education means taking out of darkness and bringing it into light. If you go to Tuskegee University, there's a statue with Booker T. Washington uh, taking a, you know, the apron of, of, of cover of ignorance from over the guy's head. So I challenge all of my colleagues who are educators to tell me who are you saving? Show me your triage unit. Show me your cancer unit. Show me the sick people that you are removing the darkness out of the eyes and bringing them into light. That's where we have to put our focus. That's where we have to we have to uh, work and think about how can I reach the least, the most, and the left? How can I create a narrative that resonates with them where they believe that if they do what I promised them, that the outcome can be different? That's what our ancestors did for us. And that's what education, that's what uh, the, the, the commercialization and the politicization of education has beat out of educators. Because educators don't have time to even get to know the students. Right. They're too busy doing research, they're too busy drilling them for tests that they cannot speak to their somebodyness. Yeah. So that's why when they come to our events and they want us to measure the students, I tell them just get the hell on out of there because we're not school 2.0. And the kids love what we do and believe it because they come and they do and they get celebrated. They don't get tested. So, in, 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 you know, and I just left Florida. So you start talking about political climate. I just left Florida. And I worked for the college board, uh, the college board, uh, Florida partnership years ago. When J. Bush ran against, was running for president, he was going to run against Obama, his claim to fame was that he had more black and brown students taking AP courses than any other governor in the nation. And it was true. Because I spent a lot of time in Florida trying to inspire kids to take these more rigorous, more rigorous courses. So now with the present uh, political climate there, they're trying to get rid of AP. And you have to ask yourself why. I told you now, when we did the work, that more black and brown kids than anywhere in the country in Florida take an AP. But for some reason now, that rigor, we know that if a kid take one or two AP courses, even if they don't pass, they're more than likely to graduate from college in four years due to the rigor. But now they want to take that out of the situation so kids won't have that opportunity. So my point is that I don't worry about the political climate. I go do what's in my heart. And I let the chips fall where they may. And I do it where it is. What we do in STEM, I call it STEM for all. I know that, that stuff is place-based. So when I go in New Orleans, I go in the community, I want to know where the people are, and that's where I hold my stem in. I don't have to say it's for this population or that population. When I do that, when the people know it's for them, and certain people don't come in them neighborhoods, no, it's not for them. Now, if they want it, they can come get it. But I'm not putting it over there. My, my $15 million center I'm building in New Orleans, I'm building it on the side of town that has nothing, an education desert. Now, if the people up town with all the money and the wealth, if they want it, they can come get it. But the people over here are going to know it is for them. So, what our children need, and I wrote an article about this in Forbes called Creating a High Functioning STEM Community. And what we have to do in education, we have to get back to, I went to Ghana, and when we went to Ghana, I studied high functioning STEM communities. So when you go to different countries, look at countries that's highly functional, they may not be wealthy, but you look at the structure, you gotta have standard structure and strategy. The structure is child-centered, adult-governed, elder room. Yeah. Meaning that everything we do has to be through the lens of what's in the best interest of these children. Then you surround the children with adults that get up every day and work like there's no tomorrow because the adults know they have to work 40 to 80 hours, one, to take care of those children, but also to free up the elder who's in the spring season of their life so the elder can have time to pour the wisdom and the knowledge into the kids before they transition. So at our STEM events, at our STEM events, we have four kids at a table. The adults in our STEM community are college students. So I pay college students anywhere from $15 an hour to come out and work. We put over $3 million in the hands of college students in the last nine years. So we have 50 college students. We have one college student per four students. And then we surround the college students with STEM professionals. There's a high functioning STEM community. Every third grader want to be a fourth grader. Every seventh grader want to be eighth grader. Every 12th grader want to be a college student. Every college student want to be a professional. We don't have to talk about pathways because they see it. And everybody knows, if I want to be her, the only thing I got to do is keep doing this. And if I want to be her, I need to do this. The professionals love it because, look, like Tupac said, I didn't get 11, I didn't go to school for 11 years and get four degrees to move back in the hood. But we've created pathways now so people can come back to the hood and give back efficiently, impactfully, and know that they're, they're making a difference. They can bring their time, their talent, and their resources in an efficient way and give back. Our children now can touch professionals 
I'll never forget we had a heart and lung day where we had surgeons and this young girl, I saw her looking at the surgeon and the surgeon was dissecting the sheep on and she put her hand up and rubbed her arm. Like, is she real? And now we got young people aspiring to be things that they never imagined before. A young lady texted me today. Last year, Texas a and came in and gave us two scholarships. A guy called me one day and said, man, I'm reading about all this. What are you doing? What type of students? So I sent him the resumes, and he picked two young ladies, twin sisters, and they gave these young girls $320,000 in scholarships. Full ride to Texas a and That's more money than the city of New Orleans has ever invested in us. Now other colleges are coming, just like they come for athletes. Right. So the question is, we're curating talent, and people got to pay. And when I say they got to pay, they got to pay our children. Because our children have done the work, and they deserve a possibility to go and get this education just like everybody else. When you create those types of environments, this political stuff doesn't matter. Because the kids are surrounded and insulated from it. And I have had death threats. Right now at my STEM events, the city required one police to walk side me. At a STEM event. For doing STEM. Now, I had been getting death threats. I wasn't worried about it. I was looking for them. Because I, I, I won't fight. I ain't fighting a <laughs> Run up on me, sucker. <laughs> yeah, 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 well, you know, don't start no more beating them. I mean, I mean, that's the way it goes. You know? nah. But then my wife found them, and it had changed. So that's my point. That's how I deal with the political aspect, right? Because politics come and go, but we keep doing it. When we started this, we didn't act one politician for anything. We look at politics, politicians to lead. Uh, I, I don't look for politicians to lead. I look for politicians to find stuff that work and then make sure that they have the resources they need to get it done. My politicians don't know nothing about STEM. I tell them that all the time. You don't know this, bro. Now, if you listen, I, got, I just got a million dollars from the city of New Orleans. I just got two million capital outlay from the state. I just got two million and an earmark from my congressman. I mean, I've never had a lobbyist, and I've never had a development director. I say that because we are doing the work. And when you do the work, nobody can ignore it. They can hate on you, they can disrespect you, I mean, they can do whatever, but they cannot ignore the work that's being done. That's a long answer, but uh, you asked a complicated question. <laughs> and I knew where it was coming from. Peace to you and your family, Professor. I just got a quick one. So, like, what advice would you give teachers and educators so we can be better teachers and educators? That's all. Peace. Mmm. Mmm. So my grandma said, Mmm. <laughs> if you listen to I stay in trouble, not on purpose. But when you're working for what's in the best interest of our children, you got to speak. So right now, when I'm doing with STEM NOLA, I believe I work for the community. So when I speak, I got to speak on behalf of the community because I'm looking through the lens of what's in the best interest of the community. So I get into it with my corporate sponsors and my philanthropy people because they're looking through the lens of what's in the best interest for them and I'm not interested in that. The, the communities are voiceless. And it's our responsibility as educated people to speak on behalf of the lost, the left, and, 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 and the left behind. So the educator, right? Paul Piero Ferro said, uh, uh, you know, the educator that, that, that's, that's, that's neutral has sided with the enemy. The educator that's, that's neutral has sided with the oppressor. So there's three things I always tell educators when I go to conferences because in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, we had the greatest ed education reform in this country where they came and took over our whole educational system and brought in a charter system. Summarily fired 5,500 primarily black teachers and replaced them with primarily white, young, Teach for America students. Hey, Google it. And this is what I said. One, you cannot teach that which you do not know. Now, I ain't talking about whether or not you know your subject, whether you love your phys know your physics, whether you know your English. You cannot teach that which you do not know. So if you don't know your students, if you don't know their history, you don't know their culture, you don't know what they make them teach, 
you don't know what I'm saying, and you get that wrong. If you don't know them, then you can't teach them. And, I, and that goes to my heart because as the first and only African American professor at Tulane University, uh, over 50% of my students came from households of $150,000 or more, and nearly 40% of my students came from the Northeast Corridor and was Jewish. So I had to go out of my way to learn the whole Jewish culture so I can be a better professor to my students. I ain't even know you you come to the world. So if you don't know them, you can't teach them. Number two, you can't teach that which you do not love. I ain't talking about whether you love teaching. I ain't talking about whether or not you love physics. I ain't talking about whether or not you love your subject. I don't know, I care if you love your school, if you love your degree, if you love your area. The question is, do you love these children like you love your own? Because if you love these children like you love your own, there's just some things you will not accept for those children. And brother number three, you cannot teach that which you're afraid of. Drop the mic. You cannot teach that which you are afraid of. If you look in the eyes of our children and you feel fear, if you're scared of them, our children can sense your emotion like that. And some of us are called to be in environments where it is, it is rough. And I'm in those environments on a daily basis. But you cannot fear our children. If you meet them where they are, authentically and transparently, not judging them, they'll respond to you every time. That is the challenge for the educator. Because the educator used to grow up in a community, and now the educator lives outside the community. So there's a natural disconnect between the people teaching our children and the children who exist. And that's the gulf you gotta, you gotta bridge that gulf. You good? Mr. Mackey, I know my counterpart is in the back somewhere back there, Roz, I know she jumping up and down as um, I see my NAAC president is sitting right beside me, my former president is sitting right in front of me, and I know that she is being honored today, so I celebrate her. But I think that we should create an, an I think that we should create an audience, a summit. Uh, Mr. Mackey for you to come back because I work within the prison system and there's a whole lost generation of, of, of people of color that every note that you hit from every rapper that they idolize you made it make sense to where they could relate to it and then to put the icing on the cake you went to I, I hear it all the time within the prisons you know, in California, within a 10-year span, we opened up 10 prisons and opened up one university and it happened to be right here. But when you said back then, when I was this, you didn't want me, but now that I'm hot, you all on me. You have something for the young people. There's some students in here, but there's a generation that's lost and you have what they need to hear. So it is my hope to my NAACP president and my former president that we bring you back for a summit. Thank you. Uh, let, let, let me say this. Uh, thank, you, thank you for those words. And many nights I sit down and ask God, why me? I mean, I got a PhD in engineering. I mean, my friends, you know, on jets. I mean, and I have decided, been called, for, why me? Now, I don't, I don't run from it. I mean, you know, uh, Lil Wayne said, you know, uh, well, get with it or run from it, you know what I mean? Run to it or run from it, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm running to it. Uh, but I was working in a school one day and I was teaching these young people treaty printing. And, you know, I went to school, I convinced them to let me teach treaty printing. And when the young people walked in, I said, that didn't give me all the problems in the school. And this young man, you know, I just look at his ankle, I see he got a monitor on his ankle. So I take special attention to him because I'm gonna make sure he comes back. So we teach him how to make, how to design a cell phone case. And when that cell phone case two weeks later came off that 3D printer and he put his phone in, he said, man, now I can make all my dreams come true. Mm. And I turned and I walked out the room. From that day, this, this young man spoke to me 
the last mayor we had was, uh, I ain't gonna call his name, but he had started this thing called Midnight Basketball and I wrote him a, a, a scathing letter. And my, my friend, Andre Dickens, who's the mayor of Atlanta now, went to Georgia Tech with me, he just became mayor. They're trying to deal with crime. So they, he wrote, he did the same thing. He wrote, he, he said, I'm gonna Midnight Basketball. So I took the letter that I wrote my white man and I scratched his name up and put his name on it just to show him it wasn't personal. So the mayor we have in New Orleans now, I went to that mayor, and I've never talked about this in public, but I'm going to give it to you. And I asked that mayor, I said, look, let's start a midnight manufacturing. Oh, all right. And we got a couple of hundred thousand dollars now to work with those type of youth to teach them how to make stuff. Right. See, if I know how to make and I got the machines, I don't need no job. Mm -hmm. I got takeoff agreements for companies in the city and from the city of New Orleans such that if these kids make these promotional things, like they had an event tonight, they'll give us a contract to make the promotional stuff and they buy it from them. So instead of buying a, selling a dime bag, now they're selling uh, candle holders. <laughs> and I want to work with you. Uh, email Derrick Johnson, let him know who you heard tonight. The president of NAACP, he been to, no, he been to Stemnola. He came to Stemnola with, with Representative Benny Thompson and stood in there and like he had seen a ghost. He said, you have over 400 people in the gym on a Saturday, no music, no DJ, no, no uh, drum line, no twerking. The STEM is the magic in the room. You give our children an, a, a pathway and show them. And you gotta be there, you gotta be, my man said, you gotta be intentional and consistent. When you go to Lowry, some look, so many people in so many communities have been so hoodwinked before, they're used to people showing up, taking pictures, and never, never, never coming back. So you gotta be intentional and consistent. So when my son graduated two years ago, he came off the stage, I grabbed him, I kissed his head, I said, son, I love you. He said, thank you, Daddy. I said, I'm proud of you. He said, thank you, Daddy. I said, but I'm sorry. And he jumped back and said, for what, Daddy? I said, son, when you was born, I realized I had 340 Saturdays with you before you went to college. Mm -hmm. I said, and for the last eight years, nearly 100 Saturdays that I've spent with somebody else's kids. Mm -hmm. That's a sacrifice. And he said, Daddy, it's okay. I said, no, son. I need you to know that I know. He said, Daddy, we did this together. Look at the people we helped. This don't come easy. You know who I am, and he's been there before. He's, he's seen it with his own eyes. Dr. Mackey, it was an honor and a privilege uh, to hear from you, your Thank wisdom, you. your knowledge, and your experience. It's, it moves my spirit. Thank you, brother. Uh, I have a half a dozen children. They're all at uh, historical black colleges. And I have a son who's 18. His name is Jacob. He wants to study computer operation, and he just received an offer letter from Morehouse. So my question is, since you're a Morehouse man, what system do you have in place that he can follow and be underneath, underneath your leadership? And what type of internship programs do you have to make sure that they are constantly on the right path? My man went right there. We are going to help my son. Check it out. Woo. I thought you were going to say, man, can you call them people help me get some money? <laughs> that's the call I get every day. <laughs> President, mad with me. Uh, the answer is yes. Yes to all of that. Matter of fact, we just did our first event in Atlanta. Uh, and matter of fact, miss, we did our first event in Atlanta with, uh, with Angel Tree, with, with Prison Fellowship, for children of incarcerated parents, over 200 kids. I'll give you the video. And they were blown away, because these are the kids. And these kids, we had like 50 kids, 50 students from Morehouse School of Medicine, Morehouse Spelman, Georgia Tech. And we had over 400 people in the gym with uh, Morehouse School of Medicine doctors dissecting sheep lungs and they built lungs. So, our goal within the next year is to start STEM Atlanta. Uh, I give you my number, your son can holler at me because everybody else at Morehouse does. For the last 20 years, from 1999 to 2019, I've spoken to every incoming freshman at Morehouse. Last summer in the city of New Orleans, we had 85 interns. My payroll every two weeks for interns is $30,000. So we spend $15, $15 an hour. Now here's the deal. Here's the good news, as they would say. Uh, I just left D.C. where I met with uh, 
uh, Robert Smith people. Robert Smith, the richest black man in America, he started a whole website called Intern XL. Write that down, Intern XL. Intern XL, where he's curated all these corporations. They created a website to help students at historically black colleges receive internships from uh, major corporations. At that website, you can you can get all the training you need. I mean, webs. I mean, interview skills. The deal. But the deal I made with them is that said, I'm working with so many college students that if they funnel through us, them know that then they get they get a whole nother leg up, right? So uh, there are many things out there. I got a three million dollar grant from the Department of Defense. I mean, the Department of Defense has some amazing opportunities for young people that has nothing to do with whether or not you are you, you have to join the military. I mean, the Department of Defense is the largest uh, employer of STEM uh, employees in, in, in the nation. So they have a great need for uh, people to come and work. They have something now called a smart scholarship. Now it's fee for services, so if they pay for four years for you to go to school, you just work in a national lab for four years. And people say, that's bad, that's not bad. I was at at and Bell Labs, baby. Before there was uh, Google and Facebook, there was at and Bell Labs. And Bell Lab paid for us to go to school, and we had to work for Bell Labs for every year they paid to go to school. And I think it's, it's fair trade. I can go to school for free. Ain't got a guaranteed job when I come out. I take that, you know, Monday, Sunday, Wednesday. So those are the type of things that we're bringing to our, to our college students that they don't know, that, that they need to know. Uh, my son, as a freshman, worked at the uh, Aberdeen Proving Grounds outside of Maryland last, last summer as a freshman. An uh, unbelievable experience for a freshman. Uh, and then after he did his research, he was able to go present at American F uh, Physical Society, APS, which is the largest uh, conference for physical scientists in the world. He did that at 19 after his freshman year. I did that when I was 27 years old as a four-year grad student. That's what all of our children, that's what the experience is one of our children have. And they, but they got to put in the work. You got to apply the application. Before I got it, one of the young ladies that I talked about, she texted me like, Dr. Mackey, you turned in my letter of recommendation. So they stay on me, man. So, but we're we'll good. Definitely want to be. All right, this is the last question. Thank you, Dr. Mackey. Um, you know, your inspiring us, and it also helps me self reflect as in the education system. One of the things that a lot of in the education system is occurring is that we're trying to recruit more um, teachers, right? And being inclusive and diverse um, where children are feeling a sense of belonging. But what it prompts me is that we need more people like our black and brown people to be in these settings. However, one of the topics that we don't really dive deep is are some of these people that we're serve or that we're wanting to recruit do they have a background, right? Like, are we having them exit school being successful, or if they're facing these challenges, how do we have them be aspired to go into higher ed if they've been hearing a lot of no's, right? Like, I know you said that you had like a STEM program in one of the areas that not a lot of education system, nothing was there to help, were you ever facing any of those challenges or like students that were having some type of background? Because sometimes it may be that they were placed a, they were at the wrong place at the wrong time based on their color and they may have a misdemeanor or something like that happening. And so when they're trying to be going to a higher education, it may be that someone might have said no. So what's the question? So the question would be what would you advise for those that are trying to recruit more teachers or, or people um, in the education system? But that, that's a big challenge right now. I'm dealing with that. I say we got 30, 32 employees, probably at 28 right now, probably can hire 12. I mean, education system right now is robbing Peter to pay Paul, right? I mean, the educational system needs teachers, and I'm thinking the teachers want to work for me because they want to be out of the system. But uh, when, we, when we deal with young people, we ask them two questions. We ask them the zip code and do they have allergies? And we've had parents that stood up in our program and cried because they said, I knew it wasn't my kid. Because kids are 504, got IEPs, all sorts of things, and they come in there four hours with us and somehow they, they, they make it through. So from an educational system, we have to look at how we are not, how we are educating or not, how we are engaging and not educating students. Two, we have to be very careful of the labels that we put on students. 
as we recruit people, we actually converting people who never thought they would be teachers. When we had those, we've had over 1,500 college students over the last uh, nine years, so some of them have decided to become teachers because they said, I never thought I would enjoy it like this. But as a nation, you have to start to treat teachers as professionals. Mm -hmm. and teachers have to respond as professionals. There's a mindset that being bred in, in, in educators that when I hire them, I'm like, look, I have a mantra that says we're not school 2.0. It's mindset. So some teachers come to me and I'm like, look, I don't want you either. I mean, we, we, we work here. We work, and this is what we do, and this is how we do it. And I mean, our program, our main program is called STEM Saturdays. We are out of school time organization. Now, we do have things that we work in school. Teachers come in there quick because they're going like, you work every Saturday. It's called STEM Saturday. It ain't called STEM Monday or Thursday. You knew that when I heard you, right? So therefore, we have to be present when the kid, our, our goal is this, when everybody else sit down, we stand up. So when kids get out of school, we stand up. And we are there intentionally and consistently. So the people that other people say can't teach, they come and work for us, and they realize, you know, these labels don't matter to them. As long as they're intentional and they're consistent and they show up, the students respond, we get them the training they need. And if you really want to hear about that, read about Bob Moses. Bob Moses was a civil rights leader who died about two years ago, but he created the Algebra Project. He was on 60 Minutes teaching kids in, in uh, rural Mississippi algebra, uh, you know, in the, in the 80s with no certifications. Show up intentionally consistent, meet them where they are, and the label's gonna go away. All right, thank you. coordinator for the Helen Record Center for Black Excellence yes. and I will be leading the award ceremony today. Every year the All Black Gala honors community members that have embodied black excellence. These individuals have been selected as one of the many phenomenal individuals whose contributions and accomplishments are a source of great pride to the community. So our first nominee is actually not here today. Um, so we have a graduate student, Patterson Amesebe. He is joining us on Zoom. So everyone, just look over and wave. Say hi, Patterson. <laughs> All right, our next honoree is a CSU and B alumni, Jackie Smith. So I just want to say that I'm thrilled to receive this special awards and, um, you know, from my community and I want to accept it on behalf of, well, in honor of my mother. She um, passed away a couple years ago and I would love for her to, have, you know, see me get as far as I've come. I mean, I'm super nervous. <laughs> I would love for, um, for her to have seen me um, accept this award. And then I want to thank God for all things are possible through him, right? Y'all wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. And like, you know, Dr. Mackey said, I live on hope. You know, that's something that gets me through every single, you know, second of the day. And then I also want to thank my family and my friends and my wonderful staff at CHE and my CSU and B family and my study department. And then I also want to thank all of those who believe in me and who have joined me on this incredible journey. Like, just thank you all so much. Um, for this, you know, award. It's so pretty, oh my God. <laughs> and just to double back, uh, Jackie Smith is from Oakland, California. She's a mother of four terrific children and the grandmother of six beautiful grandchildren. Senior Manager at CSUMB Community Health Engagement, formerly known as Chinatown Community Learning Center was the lead organizer for the Monterey Women's March in 2017 and 2018. So give it up again. 
So next up, we have a CSUMB alumni, Josh Cole. Now, Josh is native of Los Angeles, California. He attended Crenshaw High School prior to CSUMB. Enlisted in the United States Air Force Reserve as Tactical Air Control Party Specialist and selected to serve as a financial manager with the 7th Army Training Center in Germany. I just want to say thank you. It is definitely an honor to be here today on the platform in which we're celebrating uh, I'm getting ahead, but one of my mentors who I appreciated and grounded me in the foundations uh, that I am today, um, Professor Richard Baines. Uh, as they mentioned, I came here in 2007, I graduated in 2013. In between that time, I had two combat deployments as a student here at CSUMB. Um, and during that time, I can always rely on individuals like Richard Baines, George Station, and Mel Mason uh, to be the core uh, and to bring me back in from some rough times. And I wouldn't be the man that I am without the village that was here at CSUMB. So thank you again for honoring me during this platform. Um, it's an awesome time to be here. Thank you. All right, next up is the Legacy Staff Honoree, Dr. Shanika jones Ferry. With the BS and MS in Criminal Justice from Virginia State University, a PhD in Public Policy and Administration from Walden University, with research interest measuring disproportionate minority contact in juvenile justice systems, examining collaborative implementation challenges to Clery Act compliance, and she enjoys academic community engagement and advocacy pursuits. It's weird being here. Um, <laughs> uh, I was at CSUMB for eight years. This is my second time having the privilege to stand on the stage. So it's good in a way to be home. It's good to see a lot of faces that I haven't seen in a long time. You all look great. Um, and thank you for this wonderful honor. As someone who used to serve on the planning committee for the All Black Gala, I never thought that I'd be an honoree. So this is tremendous for me. Um, I just want to take a moment to I want to thank my ally and my co-conspirator, my husband, Kyle. Thank you. That man is the rock among rocks. I am a very difficult woman, and when I say he knows how to speak my love language like no one ever could, <laughs> keeps me solid. Um, but to the black folks in the room, African American, African diaspora, all of y'all, I just want to just I just want to take a moment because I feel like this night is for us and it's to celebrate us. And I just want to say, you are extraordinary, you are sensational, you are phenomenal, you are incomparable, right? You are powerful, you are magic, you are necessary. You are necessary. And whether you're braiding it, twisting it, washing it, going it, whether you got locks, dreads, you bantu not in it, right? Or you just walking up out of nowhere and you put on that bonnet. I want you all to love your crowns. I know you felt that one. <laughs> all right, next up we have the legacy faculty honoree, Dr. Richard Baines. Dr. Baines has a Bachelor of Music degree in World Music from San Francisco Conservatory of Music, a Master's degree in Administration Credential from CSU San Francisco, and has written several articles, taught many master classes, and has performed with Yo-Yo Ma, Linda Randstad, Danny Glover, and Ella Fitzgerald, just to name a few. I accept this honor not only in the, for myself, but in the spirit of my black colleagues that came with me 20, 30 years ago to start the university. 
We were the founding faculty. There were 5,000 applicants, and they picked 25 of us to start. Betty McKinney was there, Herb Marshall's gone on. So I know they would all appreciate the fact that what we did, we felt mattered. We thought we were starting a new university that would look at the community as part of the university. In fact, we even had a reciprocal university project where we went out into the community and worked with people to help bring them into the university because we felt this university was theirs. And the reason for that was Helen Rector was there when we started. She gave us the impetus to keep moving forward. It wasn't easy. We went through more than three presidents. We had three, a couple of interim presidents in between there. I was chair of the department when I started. I was chair of the department when I left, <laughs> after 28 years. And uh, dean a couple of times in there as an interim dean for College of Arts, Human Communication, and uh, Social Science. But I did enjoy all of my experiences here. And I just want to say in closing that the struggle continues. It's not over. I agree with all of this and said black history is the history of black, of America. Don't be afraid of the space between your dreams and reality. If you dream it, you can make it. A friend of ours, Belva Davis, said that. And she ground that into us. She was one of the first black journalists in San Francisco. She interviewed, she was a, a, a model for myself and for my wife. My wife was starting a TV program. She brought us over to her house and she sat us down and she talked with us. She was a truly inspirational person. She's in her 90s now, but she still, uh, she should be remembered because we stand on the shoulders of our ancestors and those that went before us. We're getting to that point myself and my wife, but we started a, a college fund here at CSUMB that we want to be able to continue that fight with the rest of you. We want to be part of the future of CSUMB and we want to see the Black Students United program grow. So you have it from my heart out to you. Thank you. Don't we have some power in this room? <laughs> All right, so next up is our community honoree. We have Yvonne Thomas. Yvonne Thomas was the first African-American student at the University of Southern California to graduate with a degree in sports information broadcast journalism, founder and publisher of Why Golf Magazine, an online magazine designed for the 21st century woman golfer, host of the annual Black History Month program for the city of Seaside in 2016, and born and raised in Seaside. <laughs> We are blessed to be living in an area that is steeped in black excellence. I grew up standing on the tiptoes in hope of one day being able to step up and stand on the shoulders of several exceptional ancestors on this Monterey Peninsula. I'd like to thank the Black Gala Selection Committee for recognizing me. The past few years as NAACP president, has given me a tremendous opportunity to reconnect with my roots. I lived in Los Angeles for over 30 years, but Fort Ord is my birthplace, and Seaside will always be my home. Many of my mentors are in this room. <coughs> Mrs. Ruthie Rotz, Mrs. Jackie Craighead, and of course, Mrs. Helen Rucker. And the only regret this evening is that my best role models, my parents, Raymond and Madeline Thomas, aren't here today. But I always feel their spirit is close by. And their spirit definitely lives on inside my two big sisters who are here tonight. And my one big brother who is in Los Angeles, but those three are always by my side. We 
are living through very challenging times where our legacies are under siege. And there are so many people committed to denying and trying to erase the rich history of extraordinary black women and black men in this country. So there is one very important thing that I'd like you all to remember. Black excellence has always been there. And in 2023, the world is listening and we know they hear our voices. The world is watching and we know they can see our faces. And most importantly, we are finally understanding that we, as a people, are a force to be reckoned with. And we are demanding that the world acknowledge and respect our greatness. I thank you for this time. All right, so our next community honoree is Daryl Chote. As a graduate of Seaside High School, he is a financial supporter of many grassroots efforts for students of CSUMB, uh, was a city councilman and business owner, serves in various capacities and over a dozen nonprofit board of directors and committees, and owns and operates the bar, restaurant, blues, jazz, and comedy club Deja Vu. Well, that was pretty good of you guys. Put the politician on last. <laughs> he's going to take more than three minutes. <laughs> but I gave my sister Yvonne a hug because we are Spartans. We both graduated together, we went to Seaside High School together, and, and you know, we've, I, I just, I told her as I walked in, I said, damn, they must be really paying attention to us now. <laughs> it's really nice to be receiving this award. There are special awards you receive, and I, and I thank God I've, I've had a life that, oh, I wish you students could have, and you can, because I heard that brother speak, oh man, you guys, if you just focused on what he said, you can do all things through Christ. But let me tell you, um, the last time I was able to speak at CSUMB, I was honored to become a black um, student Union um, lifetime member and it wasn't like this this is a beautiful building um, I've never seen this building <laughs> I uh, opened the board market in 2001 and built the gas station in 2010 and there was nothing that moved on this campus I didn't know I knew every president and every president would bring people to the store just for me as a community person to tell them why they should come to the CSUB. And that was fun. I've been out of the arena for a while. And it's now, it's like, look at the growth of this campus. I'm like amazed. I get to stand here, even though I saw all of the awardees, a lot of them were students that came in the store. And then Richard Baines was a teacher that came in the store. So I got to see them all as they went through their career. And you know, one thing about it was I got to enjoy as a councilman to make the motion to approve this university. And that, um, one, of the, one of the biggest highlights was when I made that motion, I spoke on a radio station in Santa Cruz. And I guess Santa Cruz University has whatever going on up there. And one call out of it, I will remember this forever, one call out of maybe 200 people called in on that radio station asking questions of why we are supporting the university and all that stuff. And he said, don't let that university take over your community. Well, I can contest to you this university has been part of this community and has stood on the grounds of what they said. I can say that. You have done what you said. You are now doing more by bringing the community, and I really, really appreciate that. That's one of my highlights, I can say, which I really love. And I will say, again, my mayor is here. 
even though you saw him on there, I want to make sure I point my mayor because this brother has been doing some stuff in our community that has moved our community. You're going to start seeing some things happen within the next six months around here. That's the city of Seaside on the move. Marrying an old speed right there. And you see him everywhere. You know, I'm not a politician no more. I just talk a lot. <laughs> but I want to thank you very much. You know, um, my career is more as work. I mean, that's what I did. I cannot proclaim all the degrees and everything I hear in here. I'm from a family of 10 boys and one girl. And my mother had to raise us all singly. And one thing I prayed to God was, I was tired of eating oatmeal. <laughs> and I went to work as a paper boy and began to give my mom the money that I collected as a paper boy. And I moved my way up from paper boy to district manager. From a grocery bagger to owning my own corporation. From, from an associate director of the Monterey Bay Blues Festival to now owning the, probably the hottest club in the Monterey Peninsula of all our restaurants. But saying that, I can't take the honor. I can only say, give God the glory to my grandmother, the first African American businesswoman in the city of Seaside. And not just that, we were the first family in 1934 coming to the Monterey Peninsula, the first African American family. So my family's roots is what drives me as a community person. It's not that I want to do it. It's because the love of my community. And I thank you guys for recognizing me for it. I appreciate it. And you know, I love CSU and me. And uh, Vanessa, is she out there? Dr. Vanessa? Vanessa? Okay, well, um, I got something for you. So through my times at um, Ward Market, when I opened that store, I made one commitment, that I would support this university, students and all, because I felt if they're going to be the customers, then something needs to come back to them. So Vanessa, I got, I don't want to tell everybody. Because <laughs> then everybody will start asking for money. No. But uh, here's your max. And it, it goes further than that. I didn't know you guys were collecting money. But, you know, I do numbers. And I looked at the numbers of um, what I gave to more in the sports category. I remember when uh, Tremble, the athletic director, came and said, Daryl, man, we can't even afford a, a doggone table for the basketball gym. And I bought that. And it used to say, or market. I still got pictures of it. I like that. <laughs> um, so I looked at the numbers, and I, over the 24 years, I gave over $364,000, mostly in kind and, and money. So Vanessa, for this program, which I love this program, I think this is wonderful. That same check you see in there, you're entitled to call me or come get it from the 1st of January every year, and we'll donate that for you. Make sure to put Daryl Chote in your top five. <laughs> um, and if I must, I have to mention that all of our honorees are going to get a congressional recognition as well. Um, but we do have one last honoree, and I want everyone to bring your attention to this young lady that's on the stage, Miss Jamie Booth. <laughs> This was a surprise, she did though. <laughs> As a psychology major, sociology minor, president of the BSU, member of the Africana, Africana Heritage Research Collaborative, um, a business owner, a hairdresser, a phenomenal woman. We thank you, we recognize you. Your work does not go unnoticed. Thank you guys.
so much. Um, I really don't even know what to say. I'm like a loss for words, but I really appreciate um, everything that you guys do for me and all of the support that I've been shown over the years. So um, thank you. <laughs> Another big round of applause to Dr. Calvin Mackey and all of those who are the This concludes our event, but before we go, we want to give some shout outs to people and organizations that help make this event possible. We wanted to thank the African American Heritage Faculty and Staff Alliance, Associated Students, Black, U Black Students United, the Helen Rucker Center for Black Excellence, and the Monterey Arts Council. Cross Cultural Center, the Office of Inclusive Excellence and Sustainability, the Office of the President, the Otter Student Union, and all of the members of the All Black Gala Committee. We appreciate all of the organizations and individuals that put in the countless hours to make this event and day possible. We recognize and acknowledge that this was a labor of love. So as you leave, Please make sure to show your support through donation. All proceeds raised will benefit the activities and mission of the Helen Rucker Center for Black Excellence. And that concludes the event. Have a great evening, and thank you all for attending the 2023 All Black Day.